on December 6, 1969. An estimated 300,000 people attended the Altamont Free Concert, a counterculture rock concert built as Woodstock of the West, the single largest gathering of people in California history. Woodstock, held in Bethel, New York about four months prior, was a massive success and immortalized, even reincarnated. The concert at Altamont, however, was a catastrophe and seemingly erased from rock and roll history. Based on tales of peace and love at Woodstock, everyone expected one big hippie party, but it turned into a day wrought by the consequences of the abysmal planning of such a big event. No basic services on the concert grounds, a biker gang of security, countless drug overdoses, and hundreds of cars stolen. Four people died at Altamont. Two young people were killed in a hidden run while they were sitting by a campfire, and a man drowned in a canal on his way to the show. A 18-year-old Meredith Hunter's death was the grim highlight of that day. After a frantic few minutes unintentionally captured on the Gimme Shelter documentary, Hunter was stabbed and stomped to death just a few feet from the stage. His demise started a blame game on who had how much responsibility for the unfortunate events that day. Was it the organizers of the concert? The drunken rowdy angels? The guns holding black men? Or the stones for continuing to play even after a fan had practically been lynched to death within their eye shot? In the 60s, the Rolling Stones were second to only the Beatles in popularity. Having been absent from the U.S. since 66, the 1969 Rolling Stones tour of the U.S. both showed and surprised the Stones with how famous they were. But during the tour, many people felt that their ticket prices were far too high. Some digging by journalists found that the Stones' management had purposely put together one of the highest-priced American concert tours ever. On top of that, they had made big demands from U.S. venues and inserted clauses preventing student discounts. It was highly profitable and the Stones reportedly made $400,000, hypocritical for a band that were viewed as musical revolutionaries. In response to the criticism, the Rolling Stones decided to end their tour with a free concert in San Francisco. The Stones had missed out on Woodstock entirely as well. This would make up for it. The free concert was a chance at one-upping Woodstock, and a chance at releasing a better documentary too. Woodstock's wasn't out yet, and the Mazels brothers were recruited to film one for the Stones. They'd have a new single for the fans, too. Brown Sugar was recorded days before the festival. Before they had a chance to make it official, news of the free concert leaked in both the LA Free Press and the San Francisco Chronicle. The news had thousands excited, and the pressure was on for the Stones to deliver on the concert. The original plans were made for a free concert in the Bay Area, a hub of hippie activity and home to multiple rock bands. Besides the Grateful Dead being the face of Bay Area rock music, they were included because they had organized many free concerts in the 60s. They took the lead in organizing along with Sam Cutler, the Stones' U.S. tour manager. The following week saw multiple attempts at securing a venue, San Jose State University's practice field, the Golden State Park, and Sonoma Raceway, were all considered but plans for any of the three failed to materialize. Four days before the show, the Altamont Speedway became an option for the festival. Altamont had held destruction derbies in the past. It was an hour east of Berkeley, but practically in the middle of nowhere. Only hardcore auto racing fans had even heard of it. Ultimately, the Altamont location was settled on out of desperation. The plans were disorganized from the start. Both the fans and organizers would now only have four days' notice. So in four days, the organizers had to come up with a sound system, a stage, and a crew. There was no single person in charge, and running things meaning the crew had no one to consult. The last-minute move came with logistical problems, like no portable bathrooms, concession stands, or medical tents. The local police department wasn't given a heads-up either. Apparently, Cops won an option given the Rolling Stones' history of drug busts. The Hells Angels had been around since 1948, but when Ralph Sonny Barcher established the Oakland chapter, 
the gang became notorious. That same Oakland chapter would be the main antagonist on this day. On the local rock scene, the Grateful Dead had used the Hells Angels for security in the past. The Dead and Angel members had been tight for years. And the Angels even had backstage access to all the Grateful Dead events. As for the Stones, a few months before, security at a Stones Hyde Park concert had been provided by a group of people wearing leather outfits, who the Stones mistakenly believed were a part of the Hells Angels. The event went peacefully, and based on this, the Stones hired the man who organized that concert, Sam Cutler. Sam was subsequently recruiting the Angels for the concert at Altamont, allegedly. Another reason the Angels were hired by Sam Cutler was because of some rowdy, anxious onstage incidents during the Stones' Oakland and Miami concerts weeks earlier. For the day of the concert, because the stage was literally three feet off the ground, members of the Hells Angels were asked to surround the stage. The Angels were paid $500 worth of beer to protect the generators and equipment. That was their only directive, and their security instructions lacked any further detail. Now, the Angels, an outlaw biker gang by nature, had no security experience and were more concerned with sitting on the stage, having fun and drinking beer. As the day of the festival got closer, there were mixed opinions on the Angels. One crowd felt the Angels were peaceful outlaw hippies, while another saw them as a bunch of right-wing ruffians who liked to get drunk and fight. They were hoping they'd be the former. Meredith Hunter Jr. was an 18-year-old from Berkeley, California. Hunter had an afro, stood at six foot two, and was always dressed in a suit. He stuck out as one of the few black faces in the crowd that day. Meredith had a tough childhood. His mother was absent and mentally ill, and his father, a Native American, abandoned the family when Hunter was young. Hunter was basically raised by his big sister. By age 11, he started getting in trouble with the law, and he spent much of his teen years in juvenile halls. In 69, Hunter caught the bug for rock music and festivals. Though Woodstock was too far away for him, he went to the Monterey Jazz Festival and had a ball. That summer, Hunter met Patty Bredoff during a party. They hit it off and went to see The Temptations in concert just a week before Altamont. When the news of the free show at Altamont broke, Hunter made plans. He expected the same good vibes from previous festivals he had been to. At the time, their native Berkeley was racially progressive, but the outskirts of Alameda County, not so much. Fearing the worst, his sister warned him not to go. But Hunter insisted he could take care of himself at the concert. He'd still go, but he'd bring a 22 revolver with him for protection, dressed in an avocado zoot suit a black silk shirt, and a broad-brimmed hat. He picked up his girlfriend and another couple in his mother's boyfriend's 65 Mustang and made way for the concert. With the concert official for Altamont, it was all over the papers, radio, and news. Around 5,000 fans showed up the day prior and partied through the day and night. The next day, thousands made for the Altamont Speedway in cars, on foot, and on choppers. There was no signage, so people just left their cars scattered all over the place and hiked for miles to find the concert. Estimates predicted 100,000, but 300,000 people showed up. The Hells Angels pulled up in the hundreds, the sound of all their engines being heard for miles. On the way in, they drove straight through the crowd and almost ran people over. From the jump, they scared everyone and threw off the vibe. They parked their bikes in front of the stage and gunned their engines defiantly, a clear display of who was boss that day. After, they used their bikes as barricades between the fans and the stage. What's more, they had reportedly spent the better part of that morning buying acid and speed in Berkeley. Before long, they were drunk and high. Based on the geography of Altamont, on the bottom of a slope surrounded by hills, the bands would be surrounded by thousands on all sides. The day started with the thin rope separating the crowd from the stage. That was gone before long as the crowd surged forward. The stage was low enough for people to put their arms on the stage and touch the performers. Santana, 
The first performers of the day had a smooth set for the most part. But as the day went on, the angels got drunk and the mood between the crowd and the angels got more agitated. The craziness kicked off when a drugged out naked fan tried climbing the stage naked during Santana's set. He shockingly was beaten with sawed off pool cues. Local favorites Jefferson Airplane followed Santana midway through their set. Another naked man crowd surfed to the front of the stage. When he got there, an angel grabbed him by the neck and threw him to the ground. They proceeded to set upon him with the pool cues. By now, the angel started to chuck full beer cans at the crowd and swing at the fans with motorcycle chains and weighted pool cues to drive them further back from the stage. A pregnant woman had her skull cracked and needed emergency surgery. There were several brawls in the crowd, and a photographer who tried to capture it had his camera smashed in his face. The only time the fighting seemed to calm down to any degree was during a set by the country rock band and the Flying Burrito Brothers. But after the crowd accidentally toppled one of the Angels' bikes, the Angels became even more aggressive. A Hells Angels bike was their most important possession, and touching an Angels Harley was an instant provocation. Not to mention, on this day, the members of the Hells Angels known to the bands weren't present. It was mostly prospects, and the fastest way to gain respect in the gang was with acts of violence. During their set, Marty Balin of Jefferson Airplane jumped off the stage into a group of angels and tried to stop them from beating up a young black man. In the process, he cussed out an angel known as Paul Animal Hibbets. You've got to stop that, you punk. He was knocked out. When Marty came to, he cussed out the angel again and got knocked out a second time. The violence on Balin showed no one could control the angels that day and that the performers could get it too. During Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young set, Stephen Stills was reported to be repeatedly stabbed in the leg with a sharpened bicycle spoke by an inebriated angel. The Grateful Dead were scheduled to play between Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and the Rolling Stones. But right after they landed, they got word of the Marty Balin incident. They decided to head back to San Francisco. Much to the disdain of the crowd, many felt the Dead's acts were cowardly, and made the day worse for the other bands. Word of the violence at the concert soon made it back to the Huntington Hotel, where the Stones were getting ready to leave for the venue. They were nervous and considered canceling, but decided otherwise. The Stones landed on the chopper just before 3 p.m. They had little idea how bad the show had gotten. Just seconds after stepping off the band helicopter, a fan ran past Mick Jagger's guards yelling, I'm going to kill you. I hate you and punched him in the mouth. Jagger was only bruised, and the fan was quickly wrestled away. Afterwards, the fans crowded Mick Jagger's trailer, and because Mick Jagger wanted the dramatic effect of darkness when he took the stage, the Stones waited till dark before performing. A 75-minute gap that should have been the Grateful Dead set followed, and the tension and the anger in the crowd just built up. When the Stones finally began their set, a group of about 5,000 people rushed to the very edge of the stage, and eventually, the only way out of the crowd was to climb onto the stage. To make it worse, as the night went on, the poor lighting and the draw of the stones pushed the thousands in the back forward. It was cold later that evening, as the audience waited for the stones to perform. According to Patty, she had gone back to the car for a break. She wanted to leave, and she didn't even care enough to see the Stones at that point. Shortly after, Hunter came over to the Mustang, popped the trunk open, and took out a long barrel 22 Smith & Wesson revolver. Shocked, she watched him put the gun in the pocket of his jacket. Hunter explained that besides witnessing multiple beatings, he had heard rumors that the Angels were singling out blacks in the crowd, hence the need for the gun. They made back for the crowd, and Patty later claimed that the Angels threw them nasty looks when they walked past them. Not long after, the Stones took the stage, and the crowd surged forward. Hunter was acting unlike himself, and also badly wanted a good view of the show. So a few songs into the performance, at the start of Under My Thumb, Hunter left Patty in the crowd and climbed onto a speaker box next to the stage. In no time, he was spotted by a large angel and violently yanked by his hair an ear from the speaker box. Two angels got in a fight with him, 
and one grabbed him by the hair, punched him, and chased him back into the crowd where four more angels chased after him. A few seconds later, Hunter went back to the front of the crowd, where his girlfriend tearfully begged him to stop. It was now evident that he was high on something and livid from the beating that he just took. All the while, the Mazel's brothers were filming the Gimme Shelter documentary and captured what would be the last moments of Hunter's life. Right under the stage lights and a few feet from the stage, Hunter drew his blue steel 22 from his coat. At that moment, there was a visible flash from the muzzle, probably the reflection from the stage light because no shot was ever fired. Within seconds, 25-year-old Alan Passero drew a knife, ran into the frame of the camera, and blindsided Hunter while parrying the gun with his left hand and stabbing him twice in the back with his right. Passero then pushed Hunter out of the frame, where he inflicted three more knife blows to Hunter's upper back. The rest of the incident happened off camera, but happened in full view of Patty and some fans who would later recount what they saw. In a small clearing in the crowd, Hunter dropped to his knees from the knife wounds. A group of angels grabbed him by the shoulders and repeatedly kicked him in the face. He was bashed in the head with a garbage can top as well, all while Pissarro allegedly stood on top of Hunter's head for a full minute. Before he went quiet, Hunter said, I wasn't going to shoot you, to his attackers. When Patty tried to intervene, an angel stopped her and told her, he was going to kill us. He deserves whatever he gets. The circle of angels pummeled him till he collapsed and was completely still. On the stage, Mick Jagger threatened to stop playing if the angels didn't cool off. He knew there was a scuffle in the crowd, but didn't know that Hunter was dead. Jagger notified his team, but they all agreed that if they abandoned the show at that point, it may have caused a full-scale riot. After trying to get through the crowd for 15 minutes, some fans managed to get Hunter to the Red Cross tent at the side of the stage. Hunter's face was crushed and unrecognizable, and the knife wounds were so severe that the doctor in charge of medical services at the festival believed that even if Hunter had been stabbed in the hospital operating room, he would still likely have died. Hurriedly, Hunter was taken to the gates of the speedway track. The plan was to airlift him to a hospital, but at the gates, the doctor massaged his heart and gave him mouth to mouth once more. There'd be no need for the helicopter. Hunter was dead. On the day of the incident, the Stones had no idea Hunter was dead till they got back to their hotel. The Gimme Shelter documentary would show footage of Mick Jagger viewing footage of the murder for the first time. In the aftermath, Sam Cutler was fired as the Stones' road manager, and in the years after the Stones' concerts were very organized, pissed by their betrayal in the media, and Jagger turning his back on them, the Angels has to plan to kill Jagger. Not much longer after the concert, Jagger was at his holiday home in Long Island when a group of armed angels reportedly tried to reach the singer's home by sea. But lucky for Jagger, a storm rolled up and threw everyone overboard. There were no more attempts on Jagger's life after. As for Meredith Hunter, the gun was recovered and turned over to the cops, and an autopsy discovered meth in Hunter's system, an explanation for his odd behavior that day. His family couldn't afford a gravestone, so his gravesite remained unmarked for decades. In 2006, the short documentary Lot 63, Grave C, was released and revolved around the last day of Hunter's life and the unmarked grave he was buried in. The film led to a wave of donations and a headstone was installed in 2008. In 1970, Alan Passar was charged with murder but acquitted in 1971 after the jury saw the video of Hunter drawing his gun. Eventually, the Stones would settle with the Hunter family for a reported $10,000, years after being acquitted of the murder. Alan Passar was found dead in a lake, coincidentally with $10,000 in his pocket. On that bleak day, all the death and violence went against the virtues the counterculture stood for, and for that, it's forever remembered as the worst day in rock and roll.